Good morning, good morning. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to grab them and turn with me to the book of Jonah, a short book in the back of the Old Testament. Jonah chapter 3, verses 4 through 10 will be our primary text this morning. Welcome. I am glad to see every one of you here this morning. I love that song. Thank you, Dan, and the rest for leading us. Let me remind you, uh, that's, that's why we are here. That's why we exist. I've heard it described that Sunday morning, this hour, hour and a half, it's, it's one of the most important hours in your entire week. The reason being is that a lot of the week is about you. You know, we have that long to-do list. You've got to do this, and you've got to be here. You've got to say this. You've got to arrive here. You've got to make sure it's you, you, you. This hour, it's not about you. It's not about me. This time set apart is all about the Lord, that he is glorified first and foremost. And that is, that is our desire. That is my prayer that as a church, we would do that and only that. I want to I want to thank you for allowing us the privilege this past week, the uh, three other pastors, Josh and Stuart, um, the other guy's name, Aaron. Um, we, we were able to go to a pastor's conference together. We were in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And I just want to thank you as a church for allowing us the opportunity. Um, there's about 12,000 people there. About 10,000 of them are pastors. And when we gather together to sing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, it is an incredible, incredible um, opportunity. Um, We didn't kill each other, nine-hour drive there and back, Um, tight quarters, Aaron snores really bad, but other than that, that's okay. I, I, I still love the guys. I don't know if they they love me or not. That's That's the challenge, but either way. Um, a blessing, a, a, a time to be challenged spiritually, um, and just wanted to thank you for the opportunity for us to have that. Let's, let's uh, bow our heads first and foremost. Let's ask God to direct our time um, as he speaks to us through his word this morning. Let's pray. Father, we do come before you and acknowledge the fact, first and foremost, that we are, I am in desperate need. All of us are in desperate need of you that the fast fury of this past week and perhaps even of the week to come, that we can, we can stop right now, slow it all down, and we can exalt the name of Jesus. May you be glorified in this message, in every word. May your spirit be freed uh, to speak to hearts, to convict if need be, or to comfort. We thank you, Lord, that you are everything and more that you promised to be. We thank you, Lord, that although we are, we are desperate sinners at best, that you love us unconditionally so much that you offered your son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the price for our sin. And when he rose, to, rose from the grave, we are reminded that we too can put the old away and become new, new, brand new followers of you. Give us the strength now to be obedient, to stay focused. Please, Lord, um, give me the help that I am in clear need of. And may you do with us, may we be your servants who hear you. Do with us as you see fit. We ask this in strong and wonderful and powerful name of our, our, our Savior, the Messiah. Jesus, amen and amen. Okay, we have been on a journey um, over the past several weeks. A journey includes a story, a story about a man whose name is Jonah. And we talked about the fact that Jonah is a lot like us, or we could say that we are a lot like Jonah. Jonah just like you and I, was given a a calling. He was given a command. He was given a commission from God. 
Uh, just like we have been given, but, but Jonah didn't like it. He didn't want it, so he didn't want to do it. And so he ran the opposite direction. And we talk about the, the fact that he ran far and he ran fast. In this story, we've heard about a, a ship in a storm. We've heard about a bunch of scared sailors. We heard about a man being thrown overboard. We've heard about a, a, a scared soldier, sailors, that we've heard about a giant fish. We've heard about this desperate plea, this crying out for help. And thankfully, thankfully, we saw finally a turn, a time of surrender, a time of submission of Jonah, which led what? To a really, really sorry man and a really, really sick fish. We talked about that. Jonah finally obeys, and we have seen that God is sovereign over all of this plan. We also saw last week that God is not only sovereign, but he's a God of grace. He's a God of second chances. The word came to Jonah a second time that you and I, although we've blown it at one point in our life, that God says, you know what? I still want you. I still want to go after you. A God of grace for Jonah, for the city of Nineveh, and for you and I. Praise God. Praise God. Finally, Jonah repents and re-engages, which led to what? The preaching of a very, very powerful, very pointed, it was a very strong, but it was also a very, very short, short message. I'm not going to preach that short this morning, just so you know that. Which also led to what? A dramatic event, a time where spiritually dead people were brought to life. They were, the term is what? They were revived term is what? What we want to talk about today as revival. We're going to look at and we're going to learn about revival. Specifically, um, what, what is it that takes place? What, what are the parts of it? What is the what? The, the deoxyribonucleic acid, the DNA of revival. We know that DNA is the fundamental and distinctive characteristics or qualities of someone or something, especially when regarded as unchangeable. Like, what is the DNA? We pray for revival out there, but Lord willing, we pray for revival in here, in here. What, what, what constitutes a revival? We're going to look at that. Follow with me as we go to our text. We'll pick it up in verse 4. Jonah chapter 3. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, yet, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. He removed his robe. He covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. And who knows? Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it. He did not do it. Do it. Now, we, we know as a local church, we have been on a journey to accomplish what, over these last several years, a very succinct mission to accomplish a very clear vision. We talk about Vision 2020. We build relationships so that, so that God is glorified, the reason that we're here, and lives are transformed through the gospel of Jesus. Now, we understand Okay, if this is not your first day to walk into this church, we understand that that vision is tough. This is hard, okay? It's hard sledding. And there's no, there's no like quick, slick strategy. How, how do we accomplish this? By constantly 
praying for God-ordained opportunities. Why? Why? Simply so that lost lives will be found. So that the spiritually blind would be given sight. So, so that we're not only a church where, where we talk about hope, we, we use words like forgiveness and, and relationship and life on the outside, but also that we would be a church that is characterized by words like submission and obedience and, and, and holiness and sanctification on the inside. That is our mission. We pray for this, and we long for this, and we ache for it. We pray, God, wake us up. Wake the spiritually dead up so that there is revival, that we will be revived, that that which is dead would, would be brought to life. We've, we've prayed for revival, but few of us have ever tasted it, have ever actually seen it or witnessed it. What, what has to take place? What pieces and parts need to be there? in order for a revival to take place. I, I believe from our text, there's four, four things that in a sense constitute the, the DNA of revival. Now today we're not going to have the opportunity or time to look at all four, but we're going to look at just two of them. The first one is this. What is needed for revival? Number one is a trusting in the word of God. Number one, what, what, what must take place if there is to be revival? A trusting in the word of God. Look what it says in the first part of verse 5. It says, and the people of Nineveh believed God. Now, belief is something what? That is, is internal. It's inside. I believe that this chair can hold the weight that I, that I have, the weight that I am. But trust is now acting on that belief. Belief is something that's internal. Trusting is acting. Now I'm actually going to sit down in the chair. Trusting in the word of God. I heard a message from Jonah. It was a message that was preached that I think you'd agree with me. It was not a flashy message here. Okay? This is not a come to church and feel good kind of a message. This is not what we refer to in evangelical circles as, as a seeker sensitive message message here there's no there's no like light show and there's no fog machine smoke machine there's there's none of that there's no impressive sound effects or audio visual it just kind of draws you in I'm like wow there's none of that it's a very short message it's just truth okay it's it's all truth it's plain truth here's the message in 40 days Nineveh you're going to be crushed like a cockroach under the foot of a holy God. In, in 40 days, you got 40 days and what? You will be overthrown. You'll be decimated. In 40 days, you will be destroyed. Well, that's a way to really just warm people up, right? To feel good about themselves. Because that's what preaching is about, right? No, preaching is about truth. Yes, truth in love, but preaching is first and foremost about truth. There's the message. Nineveh, the city, the capital of Assyria, a great city, huge city, filled with lots of people, has literally been steeped in sin, living, living lives of such debauchery that by design I have not even spoken about the details of what they would do to those that hate them or disagree with them or they don't like. Steeped in sin, and as a result, they deserved punishment from their sin, from a holy God. Why? Because a holy God cannot stand sin. But, and what happened? There's one man. It, it took him a while. He was reluctant. But he finally submits and obeys. He finally is obedient to speak truth. And what happens? What happens? There is, there's something that ignites. Something like took place here. And, and to tell you the truth, I don't think it was because Jonah was such a phenomenal preacher. I, I don't think it's because it's just the way that everyone hung on his every word. I don't think that's it. He just was faithful to do what God had called him to do. He was just faithful to the word that God had given him to say. What happens? 
So something changed. Like there's a turning. It's evident that, that, that God did the work. It wasn't man. God does the work, not us. God is the one who, uh, he's the one. Our job is not to convince people, please, and plead with them, please, please come and, and please just, just follow. God's in desperate need of you. No, he's not. Our job is to present the truth, all truth, nothing but the truth. And God does the work to convict and to convince. And there is what is referred to as a revival that takes place. Revival takes place when God works in the hearts and men uh, of men and women. And we certainly see that right here. We are to be like Jonah, faithful and obedient and let God do what he does. We are to be like Jonah, just faithful and obedience. We, we can't, we can't. We can't make people repent. I tell you what we can do is that we can model what repentance looks like. Let let me say that again. We can't ever force someone to repent, like convict them enough so that they just turn from their evil way. No, we can't do that. What God has called us to to do and who God has called us to be is what? Salt in, in, in a world that needs seasoning. Salt that, that, that is in a world that is, is blah. Salt that, that we're to be salt and we're to be light that brightens. And, and, and we model for others what repentance looks like. God, God calls us to do that. Matthew Henry says this when it comes to this phrase, they believed in God. He, he explains that they gave credit to the word which Jonah spoke to them in the name of God. They believed Though they had many lowercase little g gods, what? There was, they recognized there was one, but one living and true God, the sovereign Lord of all, and that to him they were accountable. That all of a sudden their eyes were open, that they're accountable to God, that they had sinned against him and had become obnoxious to his justice. Do you realize that your sin, you ever been around an annoying person? <laughs> okay, let's not get too like specific here. You ever been around someone who's like obnoxious? Like, oh my goodness. And the clock ticks really, really slow when you're around them. And then their voice, it's just like the voice, it's just great. It's just like fingernails and obnoxious. Like, no, just stop, go away. That's, that's who we are in our sin in the presence and sight of a holy God. It's obnoxious to God. Henry continues on, Matthew Henry continues on, that this notice sent them of ruin approaching came from him and consequently that the ruin itself would come from him at a time prefixed if it were not prevented by a timely repentance. And he adds, end quote, that he is a merciful God. There's a time frame. There's a, there's a clock that is ticking and every single one of us will be held accountable and, and, and responsible for our own sinful actions. And apart from what? The mercy of God who gives to us a voice of truth. Lord willing that we hear even this morning. People, hear me on this. Men and women and boys and girls. What we see demonstrated by these people, the city of Nineveh, is exactly what we are praying, what we are praying that God would do, not only in the hearts of many in our community, but it's exactly what I am praying would happen in the hearts of us as a local church. We're just praying the world repents of their sin and comes crashing, falling on their knees before Holy God. Wait wait a minute, as we are praying for that out there, let me tell you this. I am praying and pleading, Lord, help us, help me to come to a place where my spiritual deadness is revived, that there's revival in here before there can ever be revival out there. Is the DNA the parts that make up of revival? First and foremost, it's trusting in the word of God. Secondly, what what else is needed? What what else does this revival look like? Number two, a mourning over sin, a mourning, a weeping over sin. In the latter part of verse five, it says that they called for a fast. 
and they, they put on a sackcloth. They put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. I, I don't know about you, but the behavior, it sense, in, in, in one angle, kind of seems strange at best. Word is coming. Clock is ticking. You've got a short amount of time. And you're going to be, you're going to be, you're going to be crushed. And so the immediate response of a recognition of their sin in the presence and sight and the word of a holy God is that they're going to fast. They're going to call a fast. What is a a fast? It is a time that is set apart where we simply refrain or restrain from certain things. It can be anything, but in this particular case, and in most cases, it's a fasting from food. Now, we know that the Jews fasted. We know that Jesus fasted. We know that Jesus taught his disciples to fast. We know that Jesus taught us to fast as well. Matthew chapter 6, when you fast, I want you to do it like this. Don't do it like them. Do it like this. When you fast, it's to happen. A needed and necessary time, what? That every single time that you want to go to the fridge, you feel those hunger pangs? Every single time, it's what? It's a moment to focus, to reset Every single time, it's a moment to remind ourselves. What? No, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to fill my stomach with more comfort. It's a reminder to, to, to repent is what it's used for. That's exactly what Nineveh did. Everyone, everyone, the king declares fast. They're not even going to feed their animals. All of us are going to restrain and refrain from eating for a period of time. In addition to that, look what else it says that they also put on sackcloth. What? Like weird. Like what what does our comfortable clothes have to do with my sinfulness? No, 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 no. Very specifically, in ancient cultures, when someone, particularly someone that you loved, a loved one died or passed away, People oftentimes would go into a period of mourning and in order to demonstrate their mourning that they would take off the comforts of your what? Of your, of your comfy little cotton and they would purposely drape themselves or wrap themselves in burlap. Think itchy, uncomfortable on bare skin. Like, oh, I don't, okay, I, I, got a, I got a tag that bothers me and like the whole day's ruined. And yet, what, you're you're draping yourself in burlap, itchy, uncomfortable. Why? So that every movement, every movement is a reminder of of our own desperate state. They even go further than that. And it says that they will oftentimes, in in, in mourning, people would would, would rub ashes or dirt on their face. And it actually explains it in verse 6. The king actually went and he just sat. This This is the highest ruling member of the entire great city and capital of the Assyrian Empire, and he takes off his comfortable clothes, puts on burlap, he refuses to eat, and then he sits in a pile of ashes, what, as an outward sign of something that's going on on the inside. That's what it is. He's mourning and he's weeping. The whole city is called to mourn and to weep. What, what is this doing? This is, this is intentionally making them uneasy, uneasy, uncomfortable in, in body. That's the sackcloth. They're also making them uneasy in mind. That's, that's, the, that's the hunger pangs. That's the fast as a sign of what? Of sorrow for their own sin and fear of divine wrath. Oh, people, oh, people, men and women and, and, and girls and boys, what we see demonstrated by these people in the city of Nineveh is exactly what we need to be praying for. Not only what God would do, what? In the hearts of many on the outside in our community, but also what would happen on the inside, right here in our own hearts first. I read this week, though, it's, it's not enough to fast for sin. Okay, it's not enough to say, okay, because I've sinned, I'm not going to eat anything. I've read it's not enough to fast for sin, we're to fast from sin. Which means what? I'm not going to go to that place and, and eat of what? Of the same horrible habit. 
And I've been eating. I'm not going to go there. The psalmist describes it like this in Psalms chapter 66 and verse 18. It says, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. You realize what the, the psalmist is doing? If I, if I cherish, if I love iniquity, that's sin. If I, if I love sin in my own heart, then the Lord is not going to hear what? The cries of our own sorrow for sin and, and repentance. You know what I think of? I've heard about, and, and you've probably seen it before, where someone, uh, they catch or they capture a little lion cub and, and they bring it and they raise it as their own. You know, like it's just, uh, it is just this adorable. And it's like, did you see its little face? And it's so cute. And they bottle feed it and they, and they pet it. Like, this is my pet little lion. And they'll take it like to the circus or something or they'll show people. And then what happens at some time, inevitably what happens is that the lion gets ticked off, okay? And he turns around and he eats the trainer. And they always hear like, I don't, I don't, like, I don't know how that happened. Like, I mean, really, we used to, like, pet him and put him in his little cage, and we talked to him, we fed him a little bite. Like, I don't know, I, I don't know how that happened. Well, let me tell you how it happened. God made a lion to do one thing, kill. That's it. That's what it does. It's been designed, the apex predator of the entire animal kingdom, it does one thing, it kills. You realize that people today are, are doing exactly the same thing with certain sins. Just, 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 no, no one knows. Just keep it over here and we, and we pet it and we feed it with a little bottle. It's, it's cool. And then we put it back in its cage and everything's good. No one's ever going to know. What, what's going to happen? What's going to happen when that sin comes like a lion and tears you to pieces? What, what, if I had cherished iniquity, if I, if I love sin, then God is not going to listen to, to what, the sorrows of my so-called repentance. We've, we've got to kill sin before it kills us. Exactly what we're talking about. Does it really happen? Like, really? It was, it was a church setting, and people were in church after 11 o'clock in the evening. 11 o'clock. Listen to this. It was after 11 o'clock on a Wednesday night service more than 100 years ago, and a solo voice rang out, sang out with a beautiful Welsh hymn. A man by the name of William Reese wrote the song, Here is Love, Vast as the Ocean. Just people gathered in church at night, and someone begins to sing. It says more than a thousand people had gathered in that church at that time and they were leaning over galleries and they're packing every single pew and seat, squeezing into every corner. They had been in that church for more than four hours. Can you imagine that? It was a time of intense emotion. Meetings like this were actually beginning to take place all across the, the country of Wales, night after night, with people in fervent prayer and passionate singing, with similar disregard for the clock. It says that they were both excited and appalled as they were mourning over their sin. They're appalled. It describes that many people were frightened by their own sin. It was reckoned that in less than a year, over 150,000 people had made a new commitment to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in what has become known as the Great Welsh Revival of 1904-1905. What happened? Communities, communities began to change. Men and women found themselves drawn into a powerful experience of God and sparks from their awakening were soon to ignite fires to more than a dozen other countries. Lives were transformed. Lifestyles were changed. Homes and families were healed. Churches were packed and fire with fervor and zeal, on fire with fervor and zeal. This testimony of the Welsh revival that, that the policemen, okay, there were no criminals. There was no crooks. There was no one to arrest because they weren't doing anything wrong. And policemen were gathering on street corners to sing hymns to God be the glory, great things he had done. That, that's, that's what happens 
Why? Because some people caught something. They heard something and they were aware not only of their own sinfulness, but of God's amazing grace. William Rees in that song wrote these words. When I get to heaven, I'll be able to sing it for you on tune. But right now I'm going to read you the lyrics. There is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life, my ransom, shed for me his precious blood, who his love will not remember, who can cease, who can stop to sing his praise? He shall never be forgotten through heaven's everlasting days. On the mounts of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the, through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed the vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above. Heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a girl, guilty world in love. It was that understanding, right? We, we stand guilty. And yet someone loves us enough to send his own son. You see, that, that, it's that truth of the gospel that, that just not, not only excites, but it ignites a different living than anything else, anyone else. That's why we have regularly the communion table before us. That's why the communion table is so important. That, that we pause one time a month. In, in this particular church, I have no idea why. I think it's kind of cool. No one does communion the third week of the month. We do. It's all right. We, we, we stop, what, and, and regularly remind ourselves the utmost of importance of why we need to trust God, trust God, and also mourn over our sin. That Christ has suffered. That Christ paid the price for our sin, for my sin and your sin once and for all. And we have opportunity to pause. Sometimes I, I find that we race, we, we race to it and we, we race through it too quickly. We're not going to do that. Not today. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says this, let a person examine himself. And, and, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Examine. The word is dakamazo. It means to try out or to test. You look at your own heart. You examine and you test your own heart. And you see, like, what, what's in it? A lot of times, what, the Holy Spirit will take us to crevices and corners that we don't, we don't want others to know about and we don't want others to see. We know that the Jews um, would celebrate Passover in preparation for Passover, that they would go through their house and they would take out all of the leaven, the yeast. Leaven was a picture of sin. And then they clean out the, the cupboards and then they would sweep out anything that was, that was on, on a table. They'd get rid of it. And what they would often do is that they would light a candle, light a torch, and they would get down on their knees and they would literally walk along the crevices and corners, any nook and cranny of the floor for even like specks, little, little tiny pieces of leaven. They would sweep it up. They'd sweep it up and get rid of it. They would take it out. If they missed something, they would, they, they, they would curse themselves for missing this. They searched diligently. Let, let, let a man, let a woman examine himself Examine herself before you eat the bread and drink the cup. A man by the name of Jeremiah Burroughs, he was a Puritan who ministered in the 17th century, he wrote a book called Gospel Worship, and he says this, and I quote, we should, we should make a diligent search to see whether there is not some leaven. We should make a search to see if there's some evil in your heart and whatever sin you shall come to find in your heart and you must, you must be casting it out. So that's what we want to do this morning. Burroughs talks about the fact that this is what, this is, this is an exercise of faith. This is trusting just like Nineveh trusted. 
Faith is both the hand and the mouth for taking this spiritual bread and spiritual drink. Faith allows us to see in the bread and the wine Jesus' flesh and blood. And so this morning, in a few moments, as you reach out your hand to take the bread and the wine, so there must also be an actual reaching out of the soul by faith, putting forth an act of faith to receive Jesus Christ into the soul, to apply the Lord Jesus to your soul with all of his merits and good things that he has purchased. And finally, the mouth. You have a bodily mouth to take in the bread, take in the wine, but know that without faith, your soul cannot take in Christ. Faith is, as it were, the mouth. That is, by the act of faith, the soul opens itself for Jesus Christ. Not only opens itself, but takes in Christ to the soul and makes Christ and the soul as one. That's what we want to do. When you you reach out, when you receive, you're demonstrating faith as your hand takes it. As you put it in your mouth, your mouth receives. it's It's not just what a belief Within, it's a trusting, it's an acting, it's an action from without. Not only does there need to be an exercise of faith in the act of communion, but there needs to be a purging and, and a cleansing of, our, of, of, of sin from our hearts. Because the Lord's Supper remembers the Lord's broken body and shed blood, he refers to a suitable disposition of brokenness of heart, a sense of our sin, of that dreadful breach that sin has made between God and the soul. See, that, that's the key. That's what I don't think is happening. I don't think that we see our sin as a dreadful breach before all of God. I don't think we see our actions as obnoxious in the presence of God. Therefore, I don't think that we go into the communion table. It represents Christ's broken body and shed blood. I don't think that we go into it broken. And so this morning, what we're going to do, it's going to happen a little bit differently than normal. Before the elders come to serve you, and they will come momentarily and they will serve you. We're we're, we're going to pause. And we're just going to pray. In in the quietness of your own heart, that God reveal to you what? That the Holy Spirit reminds you of anything. Those corners and crevices were just little pieces exist. God, show that to us. Reveal that to us. Help us not only to demonstrate a a trust in you, but a sorrow and a mourning over our own sin. Let's bow our heads and let's do that right now.
says in God's word that if we confess our sin, that he is faithful and he is just to forgive us and to cleanse us, to clean us from all unrighteousness. Father, as a church, we are bowed in your presence. We ask that your spirit would work in us. Go to work. Shine a bright light into those areas that we have sadly and wrongly cherished iniquity in our hearts. We've loved this sin more than we love you. And we confess that. Father, we don't have the strength in and of ourselves to repent. But through the power of your spirit, you can give us strength to repent and to turn, turn away, to mourn and to weep and to follow you. Follow, follow you in full obedience. As your word says that we would be holy because you are holy. Help us to, to do that in, in here in our own lives and hearts. And help us also to pray for that in the lives of many in our community. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was the very um, last night. It was literally within hours of Jesus being arrested. That it says that he was sitting with his disciples in the upper room and they took bread and, and he showed it to him. He knew that, that when we we smell something and we taste something that we hold on to it. We don't forget it. And Jesus took a, a loaf and, and, he, and he broke it. And as he broke it, he said, this is a picture of my body. My body's going to be broken for you. And that's exactly what happened. Christ sacrificially and yet willingly submitted himself to suffer. And his body was shredded, torn, and beat. He also... It says that after he took the bread, it says he poured out fruit of the vine and he poured it into a cup. And as he poured, he says, this is a picture of my blood that is going to be poured out for you. And, and there was a lot of blood. It's horrible. But he suffered on our behalf. He suffered to pay that once and for all time payment, that atonement for our sins, for my sins, all those things. That, that, that cute little cub that, that we coddle and pet and, and feed that sin that grows up to destroy us. God knew that we would, we would have a tendency to do that. And God shed his blood to wash, to cleanse and to clean us and to forgive us, to rescue us from ourselves and redeem us. We have the opportunity, it says, that we are to regularly remember the Lord's table until he comes again. And, and because we have short memories, we have to do this often. I want, I want you to understand, I don't want to be rude in any way. If you're visiting church and this is your first time and you have not acknowledged the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, then please, out of great respect, I ask you, don't take the cup. Don't take the bread. Okay? It would be meaningless. It'd be silly. But if you are here today and you've recognized even in this very moment that, yeah, that's right, there is a lot of, there is a lot of darkness and blackness of sin. But I know that God loves me enough to send his son and I believe that it was only Jesus, only Jesus that can pay the price for my sin. You can put your trust in him. And you can be adopted into his family. You can repent, follow him in full obedience. Then please, I, I welcome you. I would encourage you Take this and celebrate what Jesus Christ has done. The elders are going to come at this time and they're going to serve you. They're going to serve you the bread first. Um, and then we'll pause. We'll ask God's blessing on both the, the bread and the cup. Um, and then we will take that cup together um, and we'll sing a hymn and we will leave this, 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 this place celebrating what Jesus Christ has done for us.
Would you pray with me? Father, we come into your presence knowing, Lord, who we are as sinners and knowing who you are fully in in complete holiness. And Lord, it, it makes no sense. It's impossible for us to commune with you if it were not for Jesus. If it were not for his body that was broken and for his blood that was poured out on our behalf for our sin, for my sin. Father, we recognize the work of Jesus. We pause this minute and we just want to lift up our voices in in praise to you and thanksgiving for what you have done for us. We're so undeserving. We thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. Father, I thank you that we have a tangible reminder and that you have instructed us in your word and You've led us by your spirit to partake of this in a way that that, that brings to memory what you have done. Help us, Lord, in the crazy, fast-paced world that we live in, that, that we would stop everything. We would know you. As a result of this, we would know you more. Father, give us the strength to pursue you in full holy obedience. Thank you for your patience and grace. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we can meet together as a body. Celebrate what you've done. Bless this. Bless us as we're in need. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It says that the Lord Jesus, on the very night in which he was betrayed, it says that he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said this. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
It says in the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Continues on, it says, as often as you eat this bread and as often as you drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And we're going to close with celebrating what Jesus Christ has done and looking forward to his return. May the Lord bless. Would you stand with us? We've had a reminder of God's love uh, through communion, and now let's sing of that love.